Hi, I'm Bruce Stillman, uh, President of Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory, and I want to welcome you to the uh, Lorraine Grace Lectureship uh, this evening. Uh, the, uh, this lectureship was um, initiated by the uh, Oliver and Lorraine Grace in honor of uh, Lorraine. This is the same Grace as Grace Auditorium at Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory. And uh, their family has been longtime supporters of Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory. Oliver was on a uh, trustee of the laboratory and, uh, and then his daughter-in-law, Lola, was a trustee and now an honorary trustee of Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory. This uh, lectureship series was uh, initiated uh, in honor of Lorraine and uh, this is the 11th uh, lecture in the series. And it is really quite a diverse um, lectureship dealing with issues of science and society. Um, one of the first lectures was on religion and science. Uh, we've had other lectures uh, dealing with um, uh, criminal justice and DNA, uh, with genetic privacy, with uh, morality and uh, immortality. Uh, and uh, genetic and diversity in uh, ethnicity and cancer, and uh, a, a number of other uh, lectures that have really been quite an interesting series. Um, about a year ago, I read a book uh, by Pat Churchland, this evening's uh, speaker, uh, which is uh, one of her latest books, uh, or her latest book, um, On Conscious, The or Origins of Moral Intuition. And after reading that book, I thought this would be a fantastic topic for the Lorraine Grace Lectureship this year. Unfortunately, we're not able to have it in person uh, because of you know what, but um, this is, uh, Zoom is working quite well and I think everybody is used to it. So thank you very much, Pat, for doing this uh, from California. Pat Churchland is a Canadian American scientist and a philosopher, um, and she's noted for her uh, really quite innovative and uh, pioneering studies of linking neuroscience, the study of the brain, to philosophy and particularly moral philosophy. She uh, is the University of California President's uh, Professor of Philosophy Emerita at, at the University of California, San Diego, where she has taught since 1984. Uh, she's also uh, holds an adjunct professorship at the, our sister institution, the Salk Institute in uh, La Jolla and has been there since 1989. And she's been elected a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Uh, Pat has authored uh, a number of uh, important books. Uh, one of the most controversial, which you'll probably mention, is um, Neurophilosophy, uh, linking the, the brain, what happens in the brain to philosophy. And uh, her latest book is kind of a follow-up on that, dealing with moral intuition. She's also co-authored a number of books, including with her husband, uh, Paul Churchland. And the Churchland family are quite accomplished. Uh, Pat has uh, uh, a son, Mark, who's a professor of neuroscience at Columbia, and uh, also a daughter, Anne Churchland, who was until recently a professor at Cold Spring Harbor, is now a professor at UCLA. So I want you all to welcome uh, Pat Churchland, who's uh, going to talk about uh, conscience and um, the and morality. Thank you so much, Bruce, for inviting me to give this talk. I am really greatly honored, and uh, I have really very, very great affection for uh, Cold Spring Harbor Labs, which I, I, I came to know very well because uh, Anne had a lab there for many years. And uh, so I'm especially disappointed that I can't be there in person in that wonderful, beautiful Grace Auditorium um, to give this talk. But uh, Zooming is certainly, uh, as Bruce said, it's better than nothing. So I want to talk to you today um, about the origins of social and moral intuition. And it is, I think, a surprising story, and it's a very recent story. And to give a feel for how recent it is, Ed Wilson, who studied the social behavior of insects, especially ants, for many years, said in 1975 that the evolution of human sociality is the fundamental conundrum of biology. And of course, Ed recognized how very different human sociality is from that of, of his beloved ants. But in the last 25 years, much to my amazement, and probably 
shared with many others. It turns out that a number of sciences have contributed to really move forward in understanding the fundamental features of human sociality. There's much that we don't understand about moral decision-making, for example, but the surprising thing is the intense sociality that characterizes humans uh, is now not entirely uh, a perplexing conundrum. So what I want to do is to tell you the story today of these discoveries, at least the central discoveries and how they pertain to what we've learned about the brain. Now, as we all know, the deepest level of values for all animals has to be self-care. They have to, as Paul McLean put it, they have to succeed in the four Fs, feeding, fleeing, fighting, and reproduction. Failing to take care of yourself if you're an animal usually means that you become dinner for somebody else. And so the fundamental care has to be in place. Now, observing that, a number of biologists took the view, as Richard Dawkins did, that we are fundamentally selfish and that you kind of have to beat sociality or you have to beat morality uh, into children. And he said, we are born selfish. Now, in a certain sense, we are in as much as we have to take care of our own survival and our own needs, but we are also born social. And interestingly enough, Darwin understood this. Darwin, in 1871, in his book, The Descent of Man, raised the question, where does our moral sense or our conscience come from? And he suggested that there were three components to it, that we have social instincts that are heritable and that make us want to be together and allow us to form very strong bonds with others. These social instincts also make it possible for us to acquire the habits and skills to get along in a social context and to understand social norms. And finally, of course, we have a capacity for problem solving, which means that as the environment may change, so we may modify and adapt our norms accordingly. Now, Darwin wasn't the first to pinpoint those three features. These are also something that Aristotle explicitly talked about, as did Confucius and the two great Scotsmen, David Hume um, and Adam Smith. Now, what is new, and I think really very striking and very surprising, is that we are coming to understand the brain basis for all of these things, for social instincts, the acquisition of social habits and skills, and even a little about the nature of problem solving. One of the sciences that has contributed enormously to our understanding at the behavioral level have been the ethologists, both those who work in animals in captivity and those who study animals in the wild. And all of these social behaviors have been seen consistently in other species. Even rats, for example, if they are friendly and they know one another, will go to considerable lengths to help the other out of a jam. And just as an aside, perhaps I should mention that what I'm going to mean in this context by a moral decision is one whereby I agree to incur a cost to myself in order to benefit another. Now that's to put it in a very simple way and there's many things that philosophers would want to say by way of making it more complex, but in this context, uh, that I think is going to work. Now, notice that orphan adoption is one of the things that has been seen in the wild by male chimpanzees of babies whose mothers died or were killed. And, and when the genetics was done, it turned out 
that the males who adopted the infants were not, as you might have thought, their biological fathers. Orphan adoption is a huge commitment and involves considerable work, and, um, and sometimes it's not all that fun. Now, in this slide, um, on, the, on the vertical axis, you see years in millions. And this slide, I think, is important because anthropologists, both those who study hunter-gatherer groups and those who are study the bones and stones, uh, have made us realize that we are kind of newcomers uh, amongst hominins on the planet. But we have been around for about 200 to 300,000 years. Homo erectus, who you see, um, began probably about 1.6 or 1.8 million years ago, thrived with an 800 cc brain and ours is 1300 cc's, but they lived in small groups. They had controlled use of fire. They made really rather sophisticated tools and they were great explorers. Now, one of the other things that this slide reminds me of is that we really don't see the emergence of organized religion as an instrument for enforcing morality. We do not really see that until the advent of agriculture about 10,000 years ago. Yes, various hunter-gatherer groups had beliefs and spirits of one kind or another, but their morality was a skill that was passed on and learned from generation to generation. It was not thought um, to be of any particular ethereal origin. Now, in thinking about Ed Wilson, I mentioned that, uh, of course, bees are intensely social as are ants. There are some fish that are social. But Ed Wilson realized that we see something very different in mammals and in birds. Their sociality is vastly more complex. So much more is learned by um, the developing mammal and bird, as opposed to fish and insects, where there may be some adaptability, but largely the behavior is driven by wiring explicitly built by the genes. So, the question is really, how, how did mammals come to be different in this way? And why are we social at all when we are? So the answer roughly goes back about 200 million years when a very wonderful thing happened on the planet. And that is the emergence of warm-blooded animals, of endotherms. And this was a tremendous advantage because for one thing, the warm-blooded could forage at night when the cold-blooded were lying around waiting for the sun to come up. The other thing was, of course, they could forage elsewhere. Now, as often happens in biology, when there is a great advantage, there is also a cost. So what was the cost of being warm-blooded? And the answer is very interesting. It's that Gram for gram, a warm-blooded animal has to eat 10 times as much. As you know, you can go on vacation and leave your lizards behind for a couple of weeks. You come back, they're fine. You can't do that with a rat or a dog. They starve. So how did Mother Nature uh, deal with this cost? And the answer, very roughly speaking, is that Mammals developed this remarkable sort of computer that lies over the old ancient structure shared with reptiles, and that is cortex. Only mammals have this five-layered cortex. Now, let me take that back a bit, because birds do have something that's analogous, although for a long time people didn't think so, but that's because it doesn't look quite like the five-layered, six-layered uh, structure that we have. So let's just say both mammals and birds are unique in having this cortex. So what's so great about cortex? 
And the answer is that it's a very, very powerful computational device and it learns like the Dickens. So that seems like a wonderful thing, but learning of course means that you start in nervous systems, you start with very minimal structure and learning necessarily involves growth of structure. That's what it is to learn, except of course in the short term of a few seconds. So in this slide, we're reminded of what cortex looks like in the very young. So in newborns, the neurons in cortex don't have much in the way of outgrowth of, of axonal branching or dendritic tree-like branching. It is estimated that there are about 10 million synapses, neuronal connections made per second in the developing human. At one month, you can already see more growth. At nine months, there's much more. And of course, finally, uh, we see the adult. Now, what should be shown here and isn't is that there is a kind of pruning back in adolescence and the kind of resetting and reorganization of uh, the synaptic profile. But the important thing is that you see that that's what makes us such powerful learners. Now, if you're going to be a powerful learner, it means that you have to have lots of room for all those neurons to grow. And so all mammals and all birds are born very immature. Neonate rats, for example, are born blind. They really can't do much except sort of scruffle around and find something warm that sticks out and suck on it. But they develop very fast. So cortex was a tremendous advantage, and it meant that it was part of the answer to how uh, to overcome this problem of cost of being warm-blooded. Now, the difficulty Mother Nature now has, if I may take poetic license in the service of narrative, the difficulty Mother Nature has is, well, it's all very well to have these immature infants but somebody better take care of them, keep them from being eaten by others for one thing. So the evolution of cortex itself comes with cost. And the cost is that although your learning capacity goes up, your neonatal independence goes way down. The turtle, by contrast, scrabbles out of its egg at hatching and scruffles down um, to the water and swims off and takes care of itself. And that's not possible for any mammals or any birds. Now there are some mammals who can stand up when they're born like, like calves, um, but even they are completely dependent on the mother uh, for milk. So, so how does mother nature deal with this problem? of getting somebody to take care of the neonates. And to a first approximation, the answer is that there were wiring modifications so that the domain of what makes me care expands from just me to me and mine. The mother turtle doesn't care about her offspring. She lays her eggs and off she goes. The mother mammal treats the offspring as though it's part of her. Now, how is that achieved exactly? How do you rewire the brain so that you make that happen? And again, this is simplifying, but the answer depends on a very particular molecule, oxytocin. And oxytocin is a molecule that all vertebrates have, but it's put to new use in mammals. Now, we know that oxytocin is essential for uterine contractions and giving birth. And there is a flood of oxytocin in the body in order to give birth. But it turns out 
that as the mother holds the baby, there is a flood of oxytocin also in the brain. And she and the baby are bonded very strongly. The mother now will, and we know this is true pretty much of all mammals, the mother will do heroic things to ensure that that baby is fed and safe and warm. So there's some sort of link between the oxytocin release uh, in the brain for parturition and the more general oxytocin release um, in, into part, other parts of the brain. And so what I'm showing in this slide is the hypothalamus, a very ancient part of the brain that is very important for all fundamental um, motivations, fundamental drives. And what we see is in two little regions of the hypothalamus, there are neurons that release oxytocin. They release both into the pituitary and into parts of the brain. Now on the left-hand side, what you can see is in the case of the human brain, some of the regions to which oxytocin released from the hypothalamus where it goes. And it's interesting that it goes into places that regulate emotion and it goes into the reward system. And the reward system means then that there, the bonding will be reinforced because it feels good. So there is also, and not shown in, in this slide, there are projections into large areas of cortex. So how does this really relate to morality, you're gonna ask? Yeah, mother-infant uh, uh, mother connections are, are really super important, but how, but, but how does that get beyond uh, just that small unit into the wider world? How is it that we form these very strong connections to, for example, friends or to mates? And the answer seems to be that, again, very roughly, depending on the environmental context, some animals took advantage of this bonding feature in mothers and infants to extend bonding to mates or perhaps to others in, in the kin and even into friends. Now, how did that get figured out? And here, here is, is really uh, a story that, that when I first heard it, it just kind of changed my life um, because now I could see that there was a link between the, the, the mother-infant bonding and the wider social world. So there are many species of voles. There's prairie voles, there's meadow voles, there's montane voles. And montane voles, for example, they live in the mountains and, and make nests under rocks. And they're kind of our, what we think of as typical for rodents. The male and the female meet, they mate, and then they go their separate ways. So she's gonna have the babies and he's looking for more action. Prairie voles are different. They meet, they mate, and now they're bonded for life. And what does that mean exactly? It means that they like to hang out together, that the male guards the nest against other intruders, including other female voles. He helps take care of the babies, and most of their sexual activity uh, is with each other. When they're separated, they show signs of stress, their cortisol level go, levels go up, they act depressed, they don't eat normally. When they get back together, there's a warm, wonderful reunion, the cortisol levels go down and they're back together happy again. So it's a very, very interesting story. And I was surprised because I didn't think that these long-term mate um, pair bondings uh, could be explained by something as simple as 
a role for oxytocin. And that is what it turned out to be. So this is the kind of canonical slide um, that uh, came out from Larry Young's lab at Emory in 2004. And here is what he showed. So you're looking at a slice of brain in the montane vole and a slice in the prairie vole. And OTR means receptor for oxytocin. And as you know, to have a neurotransmitter or a neurochemical sloshing around in the brain doesn't do anything unless there's a receptor to which it can bind. So it's important to know where the receptors are. And so Larry Young's lab stained for receptors. And what they found was that, and you can see the staining is showing up here as the dark gray. In an area in the prairie vole called the nucleus accumbens, which is a critical part of the reward system, which also, as I'll show a slide later, contains endogenous opioids and endogenous cannabinoids, there's a high density of receptors in the nucleus accumbens of the prairie vole. Now, I've limited the story so far to oxytocin, but oxytocin has a kind of sibling um, peptide that, to which it's very similar, differs only in two places called vasopressin. So they looked also at vasopressin. And here what they found was that and another part of the reward system, the ventral pallidum, in the prairie vole, there's a high density of receptors for oxytocin. Now, so far that only tells you a little something about correlation. So then they had to do all the manipulations. Suppose you block the receptors, what happens to the social behavior? And the answer is, it changes. Uh, they cease to be pair bonders um, and they, act more like uh, montane voles. So, so it began to look like uh, the density of receptors for oxytocin in various parts of the brain could change and that that might change whether a, ma a mammalian species is, has long-term pair bonding or whether their strongest bonds are with kin. Now it turns out that long-term pair bonding is only seen in about six to 7% of mammals. There's beavers, there's, um, there are uh, prairie voles, there are marmosets and, and a few others, and probably humans. I mean, we, we don't necessarily have just one mate throughout life, but there is a tendency to have, as they say, serial long-term pair bonding. So, um, so it's important, first of all, that the, the, the area and the density of receptors can shift, but also that there are rewarding aspects of bonding. And this pertains, as I indicated earlier, to uh, what we see, this is just a, a cartoon of a rat brain, but what we see in the nucleus accumbens here, for example, uh, and, and in the amygdala is that there is release of the endogenous opioids and also the endogenous uh, cannabinoids. And this makes us feel good and bonding then feels good. And so when the mother and the baby touch skin and when the baby is uh, suckling the mother, there is not only release of oxytocin into the brains of both, but there is the release of these substances that make us feel good. So um, a lot of work then went into finding out what exactly oxytocin does. And I think this helped us understand more about sociality also, which is this, that that oxytocin to a first approximation, when oxytocin levels go up, stress hormones go down. So mostly there is an inverse relationship between the two. So when these chimpanzees are together, feeding together, their stress levels go down, that in itself feels good. And there's an increase in level of care and an increase 
um, in trust. So food sharing uh, has been looked at and carefully tested. Food sharing amongst uh, uh, friends or amongst family increases oxytocin levels. Um, and uh, there is some suggestion that, that this is, is reflecting um, the, the, the mother-infant feeding um, behavior. Now, it also turns out that doing good feels good. And here's the test for that. So this was done um, in China. And the way it was done was this. You're going to inflict pain by having a tourniquet on for up to 180 seconds. And of course, as you know, when you have your blood pressure taken, it can get very uncomfortable very quickly. So they gave subjects a choice they could either be paid for their service in the experiment, or they could be paid, but then donate their money to earthquake victims. And so people made a choice as to what they were going to do. And when the experiment was over, of course, then they, they uh, looked at the results. And during the experiments, every 10 seconds or so, they had to give a rating of the pain. Now, those who donated their money to the earthquake victims, on the whole, felt much less pain, at least until towards the end, uh, than those who took the money uh, and left it at that. It was a very striking result. They also had data from, from scans, um, but uh, as, as, as an early indication, I think this was really quite striking. We also know that uh, in these really difficult times that uh, when there is loss of social support, when there is loss of, of social interaction and closeness and being together, that oxytocin levels fall. And this is related to increases in anxiety as stress levels go up and, and uh, depression and fear um, and so forth. Sociality is really very deep in, in humans as in essentially all mammals and, and birds. And we care a very great deal um, about being with others. How can you raise your levels of brain oxytocin? And one answer is physical exercise and social interactions. But we now know that there is a very important feature of social touch skin to skin, just like in the case of mother and baby. Um, early cuddling experiences turn out to matter quite a lot in whether or not um, there is a normal density of receptors for oxytocin. So the, these were, uh, experiments were done with uh, mice and uh, so in their very early experiences, these little mice got very low parental care and they got no handling by humans. Um, they were just kind of put into a plastic cup and then transferred out of the cage. And, and what happened was there was an increase in uh, methylation of DNA for, for that part of DNA um, that was uh, involved in gene expression for oxytocin. So you see decrease in gene expression, expression for oxytocin receptor, which means that there is a decrease in oxytocin receptor binding, and that has uh, an effect um, in behavior. So there are many highly social animals, only some of which are pair bonders uh, and for some kin, like in the case of, of baboons, for example, the matriline, the mom and her daughters and her daughters and her daughters is what's really important. Now, of course, sociality is not just nice, but I suppose mother nature saw to it that it was nice, but then it does turn out to be hugely advantageous. And here, of course, we see wolves 
And they are going to be very successful in this instance of cooperating and they know exactly what they're supposed to do and what everybody else is going to do. It's a very complicated process to bring down uh, a female moose and, uh, and a calf, but the payoff will be of course enormous. If animals in general, if animals trust and like each other, then cooperation can emerge. And this is of course a, a wonderful example of uh, the Inuit in Canada cooperatively uh, building a village of, uh, of igloos. So let's just go back then to, to the question about the link to morality. And I wanted to, to keep the narrative line sort of as uncluttered as possible. So, so if we think of there as being three parts, essentially those three parts that Darwin talked about, sociality begets other caring. Other caring along with social learning beget social norms for what's right and wrong. And no, social norms incidentally are not all, in fact, in hunter-gatherer groups and in mo for most of us, social norms are not highly articulable. We kind of have a sense of what's right and what's wrong, but we all know that very strict rules like never lie are inadequate because sometimes telling a lie is the right thing to do. So if the, the madman is at the door of the orphanage and he asks if there are any red haired children inside, then I, as the matron, I am not going to be a good Kantian and say, yes, I'm going to be a good human being and say, no, I will lie. So norms are very complicated and we sometimes simplify them because we think that will enable children to get the idea better. But of course, children get the idea by watching, by imitating, by interacting with others. They know <laughs> that their parents do not always tell the truth. They know that sometimes it's better to run than stick it out uh, and be brave. And finally, of course, the third one is problem solving in a very pragmatic way in an ecology begets norm changes. This is just because I don't have time to talk about um, the uh, reward system in great detail, though the, the discoveries about how sophisticated the, the mammalian reward system is, is one of the great stories of the last 20 years. But this just reminds us that, of course, the, uh, the ventral tegmental area, which is the critical part of the brain um, and, and the nucleus accumbens, these are both ancient structures. What's new, of course, is, is cortex sitting up top here. But the old mechanisms still do their job and the sophistication comes about as a result of interaction with cortex. So as I said, norms are complex and a single rule uh, like utilitarianism, for example, will never really suffice because norms can conflict with preferences. They can conflict with other norms. They vary across individuals. They vary within oneself over time. Now, to, um, in the last part of this talk, I, I want to address something that, well, I guess it's sort of current, <laughs> what with an election tomorrow, but the question it, that has been asked is whether temperament in some way plays a role in political preferences. So, this was a question that was raised by um, John Hibbing, who is a political scientist who is at the University of Nebraska. And for years and years, he and his colleagues have studied the idea that 
sort of non-political aspects of our temperament and our character might actually play a role in which political ideology we feel more attracted to. And they definitely had behavioral data, but it always bothered Hibbing that it was only behavioral. He really wanted to know whether there were differences in the brain that might show up that would help explain differences in political ideology. So an experiment was done at Virginia Tech in Reed Montague's lab. And I want to tell you about the experiment because I was very surprised by it. I was initially super skeptical. Kick the tires front and back. The three components of the experiment are these, that they had 83 subjects and each spent time in uh, the MR scanner and was passively shown a series of completely non-political pictures. And they came in four types. They were either threatening, uh, they were pleasant, they were neutral, or they were disgusting. At the uh, end of the scanning segment, each subject was asked to report on a one to nine scale on uh, the degree to which he found um, the pictures upsetting. And the third component consists of determining the political ideology of each of the subjects. And for that, what they did was they used these long validated surveys that political scientists and psychologists have worked on and adapted and modified over the past 30 or so years. So, so though that's the basic setup. And so, the question is, do they find that, the, that there is any response that is significant in, and, and this just kind of repeats the story that I was telling you, but, but it indicates that each picture is shown to the subject in the scanner for four seconds. They occasionally put in a blank with a cross on it and that requires the subject to press a button and that's just to make sure they're watching. And then the second part, as you know, is where they give subjective ratings on all of them. And the third part um, is the uh, survey. Here is a picture that is considered disgusting. Uh, I think it's disgusting myself. And um, so it's an example of one of the disgusting pictures. And because disgust turns out to be the one thing that does turn up as a significant difference between individuals of different political ideology, I'm showing you this slide. So, all right, what do the data look like? Now this is, looks more complicated than it is, but I, I need to kind of just go through it a little bit. So you're looking here at three different aspects of the human brains of the subjects. And um, in this particular run, what you're doing is looking at levels of activity to the worms in the mouth as compared to the levels of activity to a neutral picture. Now, um, for purposes of making the the data of, of eliciting this information. What we want to know then is across, this, across subjects or just an individual, uh, how they respond. So let's go back up here. Um, and um, so what this slide shows you is the first time an individual in the scanner is shown a picture of worms in the mouth, one time. And what you can see is that if the individual is strongly conservative, then you see a really big reaction. And if they're not strongly conservative, but on the other hand are strongly liberal, 
you see a very different reaction. And that's a composite of what you see down here in different brain regions. So for example, um, this is the fusiform gyrus, this is the thalamus. We see a big effect in the amygdala hippocampal areas. So what this really means is that, uh, to put it in a sort of different way, is that given all of this data, the scan data, for example, and the survey data, they could look at the first time that a given subject looked at worms in the mouth and they could tell whether the individual was strongly conservative or strongly liberal. Now, just to go back, I should also mention that these uh, long validated surveys on political ideology are meant to sort of capture features that you might more likely call features of those with highly traditional values versus those with highly progressive values. Now, what's also not shown here is um, what the neutral uh, subjects look like. That is, who are a little conservative in some things and a little liberal in other things. Uh, so what you're looking at are those who are strongly conservative versus strongly liberal. Now, what is kind of odd about this is that although individually we have some understanding of what each of these areas that is affected, we have some understanding of what it does. Collectively, it doesn't seem to constitute a function that we are familiar with or that we understand. So it is a kind of surprising result. And the way that the group interprets this, um, the way they, let me go back, the way they interpret this is that there are features of the environment pertaining to things like contamination or security or reliability of, of norms and, um, and, and stability of community organization, that those things play into what then turns out in our own environment to be considered uh, a, a highly liberal or a highly conservative political ideology. I wanted to put up the name of the paper because <laughs> they sort of, chose a, a, a kind of bland name because they were afraid that the, the paper would be picked up and sensationalized uh, in an unfortunate uh, way. So I want to close um, by just making some observations uh, about what we have learned over the past 25 years uh, from both behavioral studies by anthropologists, but also by neurobiological studies on the brain is that morality is not a module, that it looks like moral judgment is not neatly separable from pragmatic judgments in general by a whole range of motives and emotions. It's not separable from stress and um, and, and of course, it's important because nobody does the right thing all the time. <laughs> We're all very human. And, uh, and so sometimes there is conflict that should be avoided. And sometimes people do things uh, that they come deeply um, to regret. And finally, of course, because we see these interesting interactions between different species where one will help another, um, that if sociality is pleasurable, and we kind of understand now why it's pleasurable, because of the role of the endocannabinoids and, and the endogenous opioids, and because of the lowering of cortisol levels that make us feel anxious, 
If sociality is pleasurable, we may engage in many behaviors that are not really related um, to passing on our genes. And dogs, of course, are uh, a famous and, and kind of wonderful example of something that where they will do heroic things um, on our behalf without a thought about their genes. And that's the book that Bruce uh, referred to. And I'll just go back um, to this pair. And with that, uh, I'd like to close and thank you for your attention. And I'd be delighted to answer as best I can whatever questions you throw at me. Okay, thank you very much, Pat. And uh, uh, that was a fantastic lecture. And uh, I think it kind of captured a lot of the essence of the book. One of the things that didn't capture was um, the, uh, that you had been early on in your career had been attacked by traditional philosophers who really uh, didn't like the idea of the brain encoding um, anything to do with morality. Could you say a little bit about that? Yes, I think that um, it wasn't only that traditional philosophers thought that they that the brain shouldn't be relevant or understanding the brain shouldn't be relevant to any aspect of morality. Um, there are philosophers who, who think that about consciousness <laughs> and um, who, who also think that about decision-making and, and free will and feel really, I don't know whether it's kind of a territorial thing that, that they feel that, gee, these topics have been essentially philosophical for a long time. And now, now you guys are wading in and telling us how decisions are made or that oxytocin is important for being, uh, making moral decisions and feeling good about being a social animal. Yeah, and, and they do not like this story about morality at all. And I think it's regrettable, but I should qualify that. I think that I found this very interesting. European philosophers, especially those in Germany and in France and in Poland, they find the story really interesting and they want to go to work on it and push it further and see what else can, they can turn up. And so in, in Europe, there are philosophers who are working hand in glove uh, with neuroscientists. But for reasons that I, I can't quite comprehend, in, in the U.S., there, there has been an unwillingness to think that, uh, that the brain can, can be revealing, and especially about the nature of consciousness. I mean, I don't know whether you know, but there's been this revival of panpsychism, where panpsychism says that everything has an inner mental, mental life. And that even to be an electron is to feel like something, is to have a kind of conscious experience. And um, I, I mean, I find it very depressing because there's absolutely no evidence for it. There is no real rationale for thinking that it's true. Um, and maybe it's just related to not wanting to let an enchanted world, you know, Go. I except I find neuroscience so enchanting that um, I don't know. Anyway, yeah, it's uh, it's. I think it's a regrettable state of of affairs. But I will also say this about American philosophers: the young ones are by and large not towing the line uh, of the older ones. Okay. Well, we have a number of questions, and if you do have a question, please type it into the. Uh... Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. So the first one is actually rather broad and maybe related to what I asked is, uh, hi, Dr. Churchill, how do you perceive the mind-body problem in philosophy? Ah, uh, yeah. Oh, no, that's a wonderful question. And the answer is there isn't a mind-body problem. There's just a problem of how the brain works. <laughs> the mind-body problem is a problem only if you think that the consciousness and thinking and knowing things is the property of spooky stuff. And then your problem is how does spooky stuff interact with brain stuff? 
That's the mind body problem. But I don't think there is a pooky stuff. Doesn't look like it. Okay, um, another question. Does sex of subjects affect the results in the Hibbing study? That is a really, really interesting question. And I think I would have to check with Reed Montague on this, but I think all of the subjects were male. So, so, but I love the question because if I'm right in my recollection that all the subjects were male, it needs to be redone. Absolutely, it, re it needs to be redone with women. Yeah, good question, good question. Um, there's another question. Is there a region in the brain particularly involved in moral judgment or moral decision-making, i.e. Um, make the decision to lie in order to protect other people? Yeah, it looks like not. It, I mean, of course, the, the, the prefrontal cortex is very important for decision-making, but so, so are parts of the reward system. So is the, are the basal ganglia, the amygdala, the hippocampus. So I, I don't think at the moment, I don't think that it looks like that. Um, but, you know, one of the things that's really changed in the last maybe eight years in neuroscience is the appreciation that whereas we used to think that there was the part of the brain that did X and the part that did Y, what we're discovering now is that there's way more distribution of all of these signals all over the place. Um, so, I mean, it, uh, when Anne was at Cold Spring Harbor, one of the, one of the results they got that, that demonstrates this is that you see motor signals in visual cortex, in early visual cortex. And you might think, well, what the heck are they doing there? And the answer probably is because it's all very important for every part of the brain to know what's going to happen. Yeah. What kind of movement is going to happen next? Um, here's another question, which is going back to the Montague study. Um, has anybody attempted to replicate that study in a country where the population's political median might be considered more liberal or more conservative than the United States? Yeah, it's a really interesting question. And the answer, to the best of my knowledge, is that nobody has. Um, and and it, it could easily be done in Canada, which is somewhat different. Um, but it should also be done, it should be done elsewhere. But as I indicated, you know, in these surveys of political ideology, they really try to ask questions and get responses that that are very traditional, having to do with things like leniency and punishment versus strictness and punishment, um, the importance of religion in um, in the family and in the community and so forth. But but still the point is well taken. And it could be done and it, I would be fascinated to see it because we don't want this. I mean, it's not going to be very interesting if it turns out that this is just a very local phenomenon. Yes. Especially where it was Reed then. It was in Georgia, was it? Or? <laughs> no, no. Actually, he was in Virginia Tech, but he was he had he had grown up in Georgia. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, yeah. No. Um, another question. Uh, what are your thoughts on the idea that some human behavior shows that we have over-evolved the empathy parts of our brain, such as when a stranger risks their life for another? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, one of the things, of course, about human behavior is, is the tremendous variability. You know, of course, it's always a bell curve and all that. But, but we do have very fat tails on our bell curve, and there's a, a lot of variability. And I don't know how often you see a human do that. I mean, there aren't that many instances, I, I'm betting, but, um, but it is nevertheless remarkable how many people, for example, with, who already have children of their own adopt other children and have a really very, very large family where, where it takes a lot of money and a lot of effort and a lot of, of energy 
to have additional children. And I do find that absolutely amazing. Um, but there is some also some preliminary data. And, and here, you know, I'm speaking at Cold Spring Harbor, so I'm almost afraid to say this, but that there are polymorphisms in um, the, the gene for the oxytocin receptor. And that depending on the polymorphisms, you may see people who are much more empathic and much more social than the standard. So um, I, 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 would, I need to talk to a geneticist about that work and, and see whether or not it's reliable. Yes, actually, that, I was going to ask before, why aren't we all uh, giving ourselves oxytocin and uh, having the whole society just feel good? Um, probably those. Well, yeah, the yeah, no, I mean, the thing is, it's hard to get oxytocin in the brain. Yes. So, so initially, um, people thought, oh, this is great, oxytocin. Hey, cocaine gets into the brain, you just shoot it up the nose. Let's do the same with oxytocin. Well, it turns out <laughs> that oxytocin does not easily cross the blood-brain barrier. And so you can blow it up the nose and not much happens. It just dribbles down your throat. So people thought they had data on the big effect of oxytocin when you spray it up the nose, but they, they just didn't have enough subjects and they weren't careful enough and the controls weren't good enough. So we know how to get it into rats and mice. You, inject it directly into the brain, but you can't really do that with humans either. And you might think, oh, well, couldn't we just, you know, put it into the blood? Well, blood-brain barrier problem yet again. And so, uh, so there are some data out there that indicate that, that there is a big effect. Maybe it gets into the brain via the olfactory bulb and kind of wins its way. I mean, how does it know where to go? I don't know. But uh, uh, yeah, it's you used to be able to even to buy nasal spray online for oxytocin. And, you know, people tried giving it to their kids in hopes of making them a social success. <laughs> yeah. Well, here's a question actually uh, somewhat related. Uh, thanks for the in interesting lecture. Is it um, possible that the relationship between oxytocin and morality can be just an association and not necessarily a causality? Again, uh -huh. are there chemical molecules that can render oxytocin a confounder? Yeah, it doesn't look like it at the moment. That is to say, the animal studies strongly suggest that, um, you know, if you do the genetic manipulations or if you give animals blockers and so forth, um, that it, it really does have a huge change on, on their behavior. And so, um, At the moment, it doesn't look like it's 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 just a correlation. Now, of course, there's so much we don't know for sure about humans, but but uh, on the other hand, this is a very deep part of the mammalian system of sociality, I would suggest. And uh, um, we know too, you know, that um, when people when women for example, are addicted to opioids, that they don't get that much pleasure uh, from having their babies and lactating with, you know, suckling babies and so forth. And, and, and that there are all kinds of very serious compromises that are made to, to the infant welfare. Um, so one thought here is that when you mess up the role of the reward system and the endogenous opioids and the endogenous cannabinoids by, um, by taking external um, opioids, that, that you also sort of mess up the whole social system. Um, so here's almost a philosophical question. Of, uh, oh, dear. <laughs> Uh, someone's asking, why would we have free will if the mind can be reduced to atoms that follow the laws of physics? <laughs> oh, heck. Okay, you ready for another talk? <laughs> uh, 
Well, no, I mean, of course, we we want to worry about that. And we're not free in the sense that without any causation, we just get right out there and make a decision. I tend to think about it in a slightly different way. And that is that we clearly have a capacity for self-control. We can defer gratification. We can begin an action and then stop it. Rats can do these things too. And we actually know a fair bit about the circuitry. And so, and we test this in, in rats by, by putting in food towers. And, and one food tower will give you immediately one pellet and another food tower will, you have to wait, but you'll get five. Some rats can wait and some rats can't. And there's differences in the brain. So there are differences in the capacity uh, for self-control and it, it's quite well studied. And we also know that the capacity for self-control can be augmented in various ways um, by interacting with, uh, with children in, in particular. And so um, there may be an innate capacity that's very strong or that's not very strong, but that can be modulated uh, by behavior. But, you know, so sort of, you know, make a long lecture very short. Um, that's as good as free will gets. It doesn't get any better than that. And if what you want is to kind of to make a decision without any causal antecedent, that means without any causal antecedent about emotion or caring or feeling or thinking that something is right or thinking, if though all those causal antecedents are off the table, then what kind of a decision is that? That was the question David Hume basically said. He said, you better have causal antecedents and they better be the right ones, otherwise you're a mess. <laughs> so actually kind of related to that, there's a question, do we have mechanisms that protect us from over altruistic um, behavior? Oh. Very, very interesting. Yes, I think I think we do. Um, children are apt to want to engage with tremendous generosity, for example, and um, and sometimes the parents have to say, "Well, you know, we actually can't do that because, for one thing, we can't sustain it, and also we don't have enough for dinner ourselves tonight." And I, I um, so, uh, and and then kids watch and see. They watch and see that you know not every beggar can be brought home. That sometimes, yes, you do, and you give the person a meal, but you can't do it for them all. And uh, and and it it's it's a high dimensional decision. Um, in the way that we really kind of understand now about um, high dimensional decision making in artificial neural nets. And it's not a decision where you can articulate precisely the rule whereby you say, okay, I'm gonna feed this bigger. And then, the, and then tomorrow you don't feed the next one. Um, I, I use that as an example because I grew up on this very poor farm in British Columbia, and there were always transients coming around looking for work and, and so forth. And sometimes we really didn't have enough for ourselves. And, and sometimes we fed them and sometimes we didn't. Um, and if you always do, um, then you end up causing problems that you should have realized should have known about. So I think we do, but I think morality is really subtle. It can't be boiled down to a utilitarian rule or a Kantian rule. It just can't. So changing subjects a little bit, uh, another interesting question uh, out of curiosity. This is, it says, out of curiosity, uh, is there a connection between differences in oxytocin receptors and homosexuality? Oh yeah, that's a very interesting question. I couldn't answer it. I, I I don't know, but bear in mind that we know so little about oxytocin receptor density in humans, because here's what you would have to do to get the data you want. You'd have to inject the dye into the brain of a living human or one that just recently died, 
and then slice it up and see. Now, there are, I, I know of two instances of humans who came to autopsy where the, the receptor density for oxytocin was analyzed, but, and they were both women, um, and they found receptors all, all over the brain. But we would have to know a lot more um, than, than N equals two. So it's a very, very interesting question. Um, and uh, I don't know what the answer is. And a kind of a related question, what about uh, oxytocin levels and uh, um, which could maybe be a predictor of criminality? Uh, well, I don't know that that's, that that's been looked at. It's certainly an interesting question. I, I mean, um, the suspicion, of course, with regard to psychopaths, who are a subset of, of criminals uh, and sometimes non-criminals, um, the, the hypothesis is that their reward system for social interactions is seriously messed up. And, and some people have predicted that you're going to find really deep, deep differences in oxytocin receptor distribution um, because there's a sense in which they really do not care. On the other hand, they can be very knowledgeable about what makes other people tick. Um, and hence they can be very successfully manipulative but um, they, it, it's not, there's something very wrong with a system whereby you care about and you feel em empathy for uh, someone else. It just ain't there. And it does seem to be highly heritable. So um, that's a problem for geneticists. <laughs> okay, well, we'll just uh, take a few more questions and then, uh, and then we'll um, stop. Uh, there's one, do you assume the principle of separability uh, in the analysis of brain function? The principle of separability. Yes. That's... Well, I mean, you know, the spinal cord is different from the basal ganglia, that I grant you. <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, uh, there's so much that we are really just beginning to learn about the brain because of, of the vast increase in computational power that makes certain kinds of new tools like optogenetics so, so important. And we're learning all kinds of things that we could not have known given the tools and the computational power 15 years ago, just couldn't know. And so, um, it does look like there are, are so networks that have some subset of the networks that, that they call rich club neurons that are, are specifically highly interactive with regions all over the brain. But what doesn't seem to be the case is that there is a, a sort of controller for everything. Um, and, and it doesn't look like, I mean, if, if even visual cortex in blind people is used for reading braille, that's a still not a sensory job. And yet people who are born blind, if you put them in the scanner while they're reading braille, it's all about the visual cortex. So I think we're learning, I mean, we, we're going to have the socks blown off us many times in the next 15 to 20 years about what, what this blessed thing between our ears is really doing. Okay, um, we'll just do a few more. Uh, is there a connection between Briggs-Myers test and uh, oxytocin production or uptake? What's Briggs-Myers test? That's the uh, career prediction type, um, you know, uh, examination of these things you take to predict careers and things like that. Oh, 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 I couldn't tell you that. I couldn't tell you that. I mean, it's a really interesting question. And, and what a number of these questions show is, is how much more there is to get out of this oxytocin story. 
Um, you know, the bear in mind that the role of the brain in, in, in pair bonding and really the role of oxytocin in mother-infant bonding, that's kind of like from 2000 onwards. And here we are only 2020. So there's lots of, lots of really wonderful labs doing wonderful, wonderful studies. Um, I mean, one that I read today that I found particularly intriguing had to do with dogs. And, and the fact that dogs are, you know, we bond so strongly to dogs and dogs to us. And um, so the question was, if you look at oxytocin receptor density across, um, say, purebred species, do you, does it look like the, the selection, I don't know, 15,000 years ago by humans targeted uh, the, the, that particular density of receptors. But the, the answer, this was done in Hungary. It was a very interesting uh, question to ask, but we don't know yet. And it doesn't, it doesn't look, there was no real striking re outcome of that experiment. Um, good, I uh, will just take two more questions. Uh, there's, there's actually quite a few more, but I think we need to, uh, to, to wrap it up. Um, this is obviously a, a, someone who knows presumably knows about neuroscience. Uh, hi, Pat, in addition to the oxyreceptor, let us not forget the role and variability in neurophysin uh, needed to deliver oxytocin. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. No, I, I simplified enormously. And yes, I mean, there are, are many, many other neurotransmitters that play an absolutely critical role in, in this whole story. But... Um, you know, I figured, I thought, well, if I start by listing all the receptors and what they do, you know, people's eyes are going to glaze over because this is late in the day. <laughs> well, so, yeah, totally. I'm on board with it. So with this next question, you could probably give another hour lecture, but um, here goes. Francis Collins, in his book, The Language of God, posits that human altruism argues against Darwinian survival of the fittest that human behavior cannot be explained solely by basic biology. Do you concur? Oh, no, no. I think, I think it absolutely can. And um, I, I think the oxytocin and et cetera story, um, I think makes it clear that, that it can. I mean, look, bear in mind that the Inuit, for example, who, who could be very kind, very generous, had wonderful norms for inhibiting within group uh, violence and within group conflicts and for resolving them when they did occur. And so they didn't believe in, in a law giving God. I mean, they thought there were spirits of narwhals and spirits of polar bears and this and that and the other thing. But, it, but they didn't think that there had to be a, a, a lawgiver. And I mean, part of it, I don't know whether this is accurate or not, but, but we do know that God the lawgiver did not emerge as an idea until well after the advent of agriculture and larger communities where not everyone knew everybody else. And where sometimes people would be off by themselves. And so, hmm, well, maybe then it's a good idea to have this concept of a God who can see you and you can't see him. And he sets down the rules. Um, it's also quite interesting that amongst hunter-gatherers, you see really significant similarities between the basic norms. I mean, obviously, if you're an Inuit, you're going to have very different uh, uh, complex norms than if you're a Pidaha living in, in Brazil. But very deep similarities about kindness and conflict resolution and consolation and so forth. You don't need a god for that. Um, so I, I mean, I have enormous admiration for Francis Collins, and, and I think it's great that, that, that he has the religious beliefs that he does. But um, yeah, that book was written a long time ago, too. And I kind of wonder if he has a different view now that the oxytocin, vasopressin, et cetera, story has become more and more rich. 
Okay, well, um, thank you very much. There's uh, one comment uh, which says, thank you for an utterly fa fascinating talk. Please do more. And uh, Oh, how nice. Well, thank well. you very much, uh, Pat, for um, a fascinating talk and for um, agreeing to do this. But uh, And I encourage everybody to read uh, Pat's book. Uh, it's a fa fascinating story that kind of goes into much more depth than uh, she was able to in this lecture. Yeah, thank you yeah, very, very much. Sure. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much for asking me. And, and I do so miss my visits to Cold Spring Harbor and Friday afternoon at the pub and all of that. Yeah. Oh, you can still come and... Uh, even oh, though, God. Yes. <laughs> okay. Okay. I'd love to. Okay. All right. Well, thanks again. Okay. Thank you, uh, everybody, for attending, and thanks very much.